subtitle of today is How to Achieve Peace. Everybody's looking at Israel and there's wars, you know, other places uh, that have been kind of fallen into the background and yet they are just as bad as they ever were. Ukraine is still going on. There's a need for peace there. There's a need for peace in Israel and surrounding areas. There's a need for peace in our country. The, man, the, the problems and the discontent and the dissension and all of the garbage. And we just had another senseless shooting in Maine this week. The guy was not at peace. So he took peace away from other people and then killed himself. Peace is a problem. The lack thereof is a problem, isn't it? Well, if we follow, we want to follow up on last week. We ended last week by saying, making this statement. God's position on Israel is, you are my chosen people. You who are of the faith of Abraham, whether you are ethnically Jewish or spiritually adopted into the family, you are my chosen people. Return to me and fulfill the purpose for which I have created you. So today we're going to look at what that purpose is. What is the purpose? What is our purpose? Anybody got an idea? Come on, I gave you a hint, it's in the title. What's our purpose? Our purpose is peace. Our purpose as God's people in this world is peace. Peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with others. <clears throat> Helping people come to peace with God themselves and others. That is our purpose. And that's what the Bible tells us. Peace is our purpose as God's chosen people. It says, the Bible, as Isaiah says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Our purpose is peace. Uh, Peter understood this when he received a vision to go talk to Cornelius, who was not Jewish, but Greek. He, the Lord helped him to understand this point, and he, this is what he said. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable for him to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That is our function. Preach the good news of peace. In fact, that's what Jesus did. In Ephesians, Paul said, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. That's what Jesus did. In fact, he has a title. He's called the Prince of Peace. And because that's what Jesus did, that's what he expects us to do. And as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God or experience peace. Be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we in him might become the righteousness of God. So our purpose as God's people, as God's chosen people, is peace. Thinking about that a little bit um, raises some questions. As Christians, how far should we go in, 
in uh, agitating for a position? Um, what kind of tactics should we use to push to promote our agenda, which is Jesus Christ? Uh, we sing songs like Onward Question Soldiers. Uh, in a sense we are, but does that mean that we are to be that aggressive? Uh, we are a people of peace. Uh, there's just some questions that come to mind when we think about that. Before, as we go on though, we need to uh, answer another question, and that is, what is peace? We need to make sure we're all on the same page here, <clears throat> talking about peace. Some people simply think, in, a, in our country it seems to be, that the, the common definition for peace is just the absence of turmoil, the absence of strife. The absence of disagreement. Uh, is that all the peace is? Peace is more than that, isn't it? What is peace? Well, in order to understand the Bible's understanding of peace, we need to look at the, the words. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but we're going to see what they mean. Anybody ever heard the word shalom? That's the, Greek, the Hebrew word that we translate peace. But what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, from the dictionary, <laughs> by the way, that's, that's what Hebrew looks like. I can't read Hebrew either. That's what shalom looks like in Hebrew. Uh, sh shalom means completeness, soundness, welfare, all of those are synonyms for peace. A, uh, a picture, the best picture of peace that I know of, let's back up here for just a minute, is right there in the Garden of Eden. Think about, think about what it was like. Do you remember what it was like? The Bible says, and we're not going to go back and read all of it, but the Bible says that Eden was a well-watered place that had, was, God provided all kinds of trees and plants for food. Adam and Eve didn't have to work. They just, if they were hungry, they'd go pick something and eat it. If they were tired, they'd lay down and sleep. If they... And it says that God walked with them in the garden, and they had fellowship with God, and there was no stress. There was no, there was no evil. There was no sin. There was no disagreement. Everybody, all three were in harmony, God and Adam and Eve. It was a place of peace. That's what God's plan is, is to restore his creation to that state of peace as it was in Edom. A place of completeness, soundness, of welfare. A place where there's no shortage, there's no lack, there's nothing that's imperfect, there's nothing broken, there's no strife, there's no discontentment. Everything is as it should be. That's what the Hebrew word shalom means. Now in Greek, the word is arene. And it's used more like we use the term peace. Um, and the, one of the main uses is it means the opposite of war and dissension. That's kind of what we tend to understand. Uh, it also means harmony among individuals. In Hebrews 7, 2, king of peace means a peaceful king. Metaphorically speaking, we're talking about peace of mind or tranquility. Not what you get from taking drugs, but peace of mind because of a right relationship with, with God. It Metaphorically, again, is peace of mind arising from reconciliation with God and a sense of his favor. I'm at peace because I know I'm right with God. That's what we are talking about. Now, one other thing we need to understand about peace, 
when, it, when the Bible talks about it is that peace is the outcome of righteousness and holiness. Think about that a minute. Uh, peace is the outcome of righteousness or holiness. Peace is not the outcome of defeating your enemies. Peace is not the, out, is not the absence of war. Peace is the result of righteousness. That's what the Bible says in Isaiah 32. The Bible says the effect of righteousness will be peace. The result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. Peace is the outcome of righteousness. Paul explained this in Romans. He said, He, that is, God will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. And because of this, we are also told in Hebrews to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Peace is the outcome of righteousness and holiness. And if that's true, then the opposite is also true, and that is that peace and evil do not mix. Peace and evil do not mix. The peace the Bible talks about does not mix with evil. As the psalmist said, mark the blameless and behold the upright. For there's a future for the man of peace. But transgressors or sinners shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Peace and evil do not mix. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear that there is no peace for the wicked. In fact, that's exactly what it says in two places in Isaiah. There's no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Isaiah 48, 22. And again, there's no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Isaiah 57, 21. You wonder why there's no peace in, Israel, in, in, in the Middle East? <laughs> well, how much righteousness is there? Or anywhere, for that matter. It's just that our focus right now is on the Middle East. Peace and evil do not mix and there is no peace for the wicked well understanding these things that this is what we're talking about peace how is peace achieved how do we achieve peace well there are a number of theories <clears throat> floating around the world um, there's four of them we're going to look at today and there's some actually there's some truth in each one of these The first idea is that we achieve peace by capitulation. You know what capitulation means? You get a fancy word for surrender. You want peace? Just give in to the person that's trying to make you do something. You want peace? Just give in. Um, in August, uh, there was a news article that I, I came across. I'll just read a couple Short paragraphs. Anybody know who Dmitry Medvedev, Medvedev is? He's the, he was the former prime minister of Russia, right? He's a friend of Vladimir Putin. He's former pre prime minister and president. He's become one of Moscow's most prominent war hawks. He has asserted that Ukrainian capitulation is the only path to peace. As Kiev's forces continue a slow counteroffensive, which they're still trying to do. 
He said the people suffering in the trenches of a divided country really need only capitulation, which could potentially pave the way to peace. Well, of course he's going to say that. They're trying, they've invaded Ukraine trying to take over Ukraine. If those folks would just give in and let us have our way, there would be peace. That's what he's saying. That is a form of peace. The Bible even talks about peace through capitulation. Jesus told a story, or made a reference in uh, Luke 14. He said, what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate, whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. He capitulates. He gives in. He surrenders before losing all of his people. Now, uh, spiritually, there is some validity to this concept of, of surrendering. I mean, isn't that what we do when we come to Christ? We surrender our lives to Him. We give in to His will. So it's not necessarily a negative thing. But we give, we capitulate to God's will. We give in, we surrender to what He wants. We surrender our lives to Him. That is how we... That is one part of how we establish peace with God. is through capitulation. There's a from the from the worldly point of view, it's not really a solution. Not for those who capitulate, because those who were once maybe free are now under the rule of someone who forced themselves upon them. So there's another way people have advanced to. Uh, achieve peace, and that's education. Oh, if people were just educated, they wouldn't fight so much. Uh, I came across this. It's from an organization called Central Asia Institute. Top 10 ways to pro education promotes peace. Uh, there's, there's, you know, education can help promote peace, but it doesn't achieve Uh, education boosts confidence and hope. Education promotes independent thinking. Education inspires problem solving skills. Education builds communication skills. Education opens doors, reduces poverty, increases political involvement, reduces support of terrorism and militancy, builds empathy and tolerance, and cultivates respect. Well, it can, but there's a limit to how much peace education is ever going to achieve. So education is one way that the world says, oh yeah, but did you know the Bible also says that education contributes to peace? It doesn't, it's not the thing that achieves it ultimately and, and completely, but it certainly contributes to it. Uh, for instance, in Proverbs, Proverbs 3 says, my son, do not forget my teaching, education, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Again in Psalm, great peace have those who love your law, who know your law, who have learned your law. Nothing can make them stumble. And again in Isaiah, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. There is benefit to education. There is definite benefit education, but is not the be-all, end-all for achieving peace. It does help. And again, there's a benediction in 2 Peter. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So education isn't the final solution, but it can be part of the solution as far as helping us to get closer to the kind of peace that God wants His people to spread around the world. Remember, our purpose as God's chosen people is peace. Well, there's another one that the psychological psychology community seems to think is important. That's self-actualization. That's a big word. Um, it's big enough that I put a definition in your notes for you. 
<laughs> All it means is striving to reach one's full potential and fulfill one's unique purpose, driven by an instinctive internal desire for personal growth and development. In other words, their whole idea about self-actualization is, is there's something in every one, one of us that wants to be better than we already are. I know a lot of people that's not necessarily true. But that's what they say. That every one of us wants to be better than what we are. And if we get better, the better we become as human beings, the more peace we will find in our lives. And that's kind of the quote there. Um, the better a person I become, the more at peace I will be. That's their, that's their whole approach to peace. Now, they, they've kind of gone in the right direction, but they slightly missed the biblical mark. Um, so, self-actualization can help, but very the average person in the world is too busy just trying to survive to spend much time seeking self-actualization. <laughs> and so it doesn't work. However, the Bible, in its own way, talks about this concept of self-actualization to achieve peace. Paul told us in Ephesians, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, Paul is saying, look, God created us. He created Adam and Eve perfect, unstained by evil or sin, and he's made it possible for us to get back there, to become the people who we were created to be, to realize our full potential as created in God's image. That is a form, that is a Christian form of self-actualization, and it's can't, you can't call it self-actualization because it's God who does it, not us. We don't, we don't get there by our own efforts. But God does this. We choose to let him do it, and he does it. So that's the third way that people seem to think we can achieve peace. The fourth one is probably the oldest way. And that's by annihilation. You want peace? Just destroy those who are opposed to you. Stomp them out of existence. If there's no dissension, then what's going to be left? Peace, right? That's the theory. Annihilate your enemies, you will have peace. That seems to be the, uh, general, the general approach of Hamas, Hezbollah, all those who hate Israel, we hate them. The only way we're going to have peace is to wipe them off the face of the planet. Isn't that what they, that's what we tend to hear them say, right? Did you know that uh, God told Israel to do the same thing? Did you know that because Israel disobeyed God and did not totally destroy the seven nations that they displaced when God gave them the land of Israel, that we have this ongoing problem? Look what it says in Deuteronomy. God told them this, In the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes but you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they've done for their gods. And so you sin against the Lord your God. They didn't go in and totally destroy them. In fact, they made a they made a peace pact with the Jebusites. If you look back there, you can read that story. But because they didn't do that, because they didn't do what God told them to do there, they are still suffering the consequences. Because God told them to annihilate their enemies. 
Did you know that when Christ comes back, he's going to annihilate his enemies and establish peace? See, lasting peace is achieved through annihilation of evil. Go back to Eden. There was peace. Why was there peace? There was no evil. There was no sin until Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then evil came into the world and we lost our peace. Lasting peace is achieved through the annihilation of evil. Not only evil worldwide, but evil in our own hearts. If we want, if we want peace with God, with ourselves with others, then we have to let God take evil out of us. That's what it means to let him be in control. That's what it means to surrender to him. That's what it means to have our sins forgiven. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit and empowered to live free from sin. Paul explained this in Romans when he said, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. In other words, in order that sin might be destroyed in us so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace." Lasting peace with God, with ourselves, with others, is achieved through the annihilation of evil in our lives. Letting God take it away and leaving it in His hands and trusting Him and not letting sin have dominion. Lasting peace is achieved through annihilation. That annihilation is accomplished only by the Prince of Peace. We can't do it for ourselves. We cannot achieve peace. We can't. But God can. That's why God came. He sent His Son to establish peace on earth, in us, around the world. Peace is accomplished by the Prince of Peace. In Isaiah, He's called this. For to us a child is born, and we're talking about Jesus here, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Whenever God the Son, the Prince of Peace, is allowed to have control of a life, peace in this world will have increased. If he is the governor of your life, there will be an increase of peace in your life. And because of the increase in your the peace in your life, there will also be an increase of peace around you. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. But not only do we, does the Prince of Peace accomplish this in us, but he accomplished it around the world. He's going to establish world peace. World peace is not the pipe dream that the beauty pageant contestants make it out to be. World peace is a coming reality. 
When it happens, we don't know exactly, but it's coming. The Bible makes it clear that when Christ returns, there will be world peace. Again in Isaiah, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is talking about the Messiah again, Jesus Christ. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. When Christ returns, he is going to eradicate evil, and in doing so establish his peace on this earth. John said much the same thing in his revelation. It's a more of a, a vision that he saw, but it's saying pretty much the same thing. Then I saw heaven open, John said, and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called out to all the birds that flew directly overhead. Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done signs by which, the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. When Christ returns... He is going to restore Eden. And those in his great army riding behind him are his chosen people. They are Israel, the nation and the church. All of those of the faith of Abraham. He is going to eradicate evil and establish peace on this earth for his kingdom. In the meantime, he has sent his spirit to establish peace in our lives. When Christ comes into our lives, he establishes personal peace. And it is God who does it. We can't achieve peace, as I have said, by our efforts. The only thing we can do to achieve peace is to surrender our lives to God and let Him establish His peace in our lives. As Paul concluded in the book of 1 Thessalonians, he said, Now may the God of peace, may the God of peace Himself, sanctify you completely, that is, set you apart completely for His work, for His purposes. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. When Christ returns, 
he is going to restore his people to what we were in Eden. In fact, we could go so far as to say that Israel is Eden restored. If we are of Israel, if we are people of the faith of Abraham, we are Israel, and Israel is Edom restored. It's being restored now, and when Christ returns, it will be completed. We can also say it this way, Israel is where the Prince of Peace annihilates evil and reigns in peace. Israel is where the Prince of Peace annihilates evil and reigns in peace. Israel, the nation, is not at peace at the moment. But there is coming a day when Christ returns that he will establish peace there and around the world. And in the meantime, he wants to establish peace in our hearts and our lives. In other words, he wants us to become citizens of Israel, if we aren't already. So become a citizen of Israel. That is, make Jesus your Prince of Peace, if you have not already. If you want to achieve peace in this world, this is how you do it now. You try any other way to achieve peace in your life or for the world around you other than this, and you will fail. But if you become a citizen of Israel by making Jesus Christ your Prince of Peace, you will find peace. That is the promise of God's Word. Well, how do we do that? Simple. First, humble yourself before Him. Acknowledge that you can't do it. Acknowledge that He is the Prince of Peace. Come to terms with reality. Humble yourself before Him. Then beg His forgiveness for trying to do it on your own. Beg His forgiveness and ask Him to remove the evil from your life. And then give Him complete reign over your life. God, I want peace. I recognize that I can't achieve it. I know you can. I want you to. Please forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Please forgive me for my sin. Please come into my life and take the evil out of it. And Lord, come in and take control. Be the king of my life. Have complete reign over me. That's what we need to do. Remember the verse from last week. The condition and the promise. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God wants you to experience peace. And you can through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for making your word clear. Lord, thank you for wanting to do everything necessary to bring peace to this world and to each one of us. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. You are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you do establish peace. And you will 
establish peace. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.